May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The last track on the second side of the 1969 Rolling Stones album, Let It Bleed, is a seven minute and 28 second masterpiece of rock and roll music entitled, You Can't Always Get What You Want. And after being serenaded by the London Bach Choir's rendition of the song's chorus, Mick Jagger then chimes in with that strident voice of his to reiterate the fact that you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. For some reason, this song was stuck in my head this week as I was reading over Paul's words to us in Romans 7 and preparing for today's sermon. And I realized that if the Apostle Paul had written those lyrics instead of Mick and Keith, they might sound something like this. You can't always do what you want. But if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you hate. So just listen to what Paul says in verse 15, and then again in verse 19 of Romans 7. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I do not the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. I think many of us have parts of the Bible that are particularly near and dear to our hearts and pieces of the scripture that we're particularly thankful for. You know, things like Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 or Paul's account of Christian love in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, love is patient, love is kind. Well, for me, this section of Romans 7 that we read this morning is one of those passages of scripture that I find myself continually thanking God for including in the Bible. And that's because in it, we find Paul delving into what is the real nitty gritty of the everyday lived human experience. And while in the end, this passage is full of good news and comfort, it also provides us with a bit of a reality check and a hard one at that. Because if I'm being honest, I deeply identify with the struggle that Paul speaks of. And I'm sure that in one way or another, you do too. Because in your life, even in your life as a Christian, maybe especially in your life as a Christian, how many times have you felt just like this person that Paul describes in these verses? How often have you tried your hardest to move past a habitual sin or resolved to become more loving or more forgiving or more caring or more honest, only to find yourself right back where you started? Or how often have you found yourself in a situation where you knew exactly what the right and godly thing to do was and then totally failed to do it? How many of your most profound failings and in turn your places of deepest shame and regret have been born of this exact predicament that Paul is speaking of? I know for me, the answer is just about every single one of them. You know, the Bible has this reputation these days of being an old book that's out of touch with the reality of modern everyday life. But this passage, I think, is proof that the Bible is every bit as relevant in the 21st century as it was when each of its books were written long ago. Because here we see Paul speaking to a universal truth about the human condition. That's every bit as true in the 21st century as it was in the first century. Which is that we are all trapped in cycles of self-serving and self-destructive behavior that we can't break out of on our own. But the language the Bible uses to describe these patterns and behaviors is sin. And that's exactly what we find Paul talking about in the beginning of our passage today. And Paul wants us to know two things about sin. The first 
you can see there in verse 14, is Paul says that we are sold under sin, that we're sold under sin. So John Stott, the great 20th century Anglican evangelical and other commentators have all pointed out that the verb that Paul uses here for sold had a really specific use in the ancient Greek world. And it was always used in connection with the buying and selling of slaves. It was about buying and selling people into slavery. So what Paul is saying here is that he and all of us find ourselves subject to this power called sin that we can't free ourselves of, much like a slave. The second thing Paul says about sin is in verse 17, and he says that sin dwells in us, that sin lives inside of us. Another way to say this maybe is that we have a sin nature. And this is exactly why we often find ourselves in the predicament of not doing the good that we want and then doing the evil thing that we hate. Paul is saying that we can know what the right and good thing to do is. We can know that God's law, God's commandments are holy and just and good. We just sang that in Psalm 19. God's law is perfect. We can know all of that and still not do it because on our own, we simply don't possess the power to do so. Modern psychology actually has a term for the very phenomenon that Paul is talking about, and it's called present bias. So in 1999, two psychologists conducted a study where the participants were to pick three movies out of a selection of 24 to watch. And the movies were a mix of all different kinds of things, from kind of more lowbrow, fun, lighthearted movies like Mrs. Doubtfire to more heavy, serious critically acclaimed films like Schindler's List. Now, most everyone in the study picked Schindler's List as one of their three movies due to the fact that it had won numerous awards, it had received tons of positive reviews. Yet, despite all the critical acclaim and the lofty reputation, pretty much no one chose to watch Schindler's List on the first day of the study. Because even though everyone knew that it was a great movie, it is far, far easier to watch Mrs. Doubtfire instead. It requires way less of an investment of yourself. So David McRaney, who referenced this study in an article of his, goes on to say, present bias explains why you buy lettuce and bananas only to throw them out later when you forget to eat them. We've all done that. Present bias is why you've made the same resolution 10 years in a row but this time, you mean it. You're going to lose weight and forge a six-pack of abs so ripped that you could deflect arrows. One day, you have the choice between running around the block or watching a movie. You choose a movie. Another day, you're out with friends and have a choice between a cheeseburger and a salad. You choose the cheeseburger. The slips become more frequent. But you keep saying, you'll get around to it. You'll start again on Monday, which becomes a week from Monday. Your will succumbs to a death by a thousand cuts. So this is the same predicament that we face when it comes to living rightly before God. So we resolve to fix this or to fix that about ourselves, to will ourselves to become more like Jesus to be more loving, to be more generous, to be more gracious. And it's a perfectly good thing for us to desire, right? Because that's what God made us for, to conform us to the image of Christ. But if our hopes in ourselves and in our own willpower to change our hearts, we will fail and will fail miserably because we'll find that no matter how much we might know and want to do the good, what we lack is the power to do it. And we'll find that doing what's evil often feels kind of like it's our human system's default setting. We can do it without even trying. And after living in the frustration and the shame of this war within ourselves that Paul's talking about, 
we'll find ourselves right there with Paul crying out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I think no one in the world understands the predicament that Paul is talking about more than our friends in the recovery community, those who are involved in the 12-step program like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or any of their related 12-step programs. Because for someone who's an addict, they know 100% that the thing that they're addicted to is destroying their life. They can see how their addiction is harming their body, or how it's ripping apart their relationships, or how it's winnowed away every last penny that they have, or they see how their career is now at a dead end because of it. Yet all the willpower in the world that the addict can muster up can't make the addiction go away. It can't create a cure. And if you're familiar with the 12 steps, you know that the first step, which is really the key to recovery and healing, is to admit your powerlessness over your addiction, that you can do nothing on your own in the face of it. And the second step is then trusting in God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Now, obviously, millions of people have found sobriety and healing through 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason they work is because they were founded by Christians, and the wisdom of AA is the wisdom of Scripture. It's based in the gospel. And if you look closely, you'll see that this exact dynamic of our powerlessness and God meeting us there actually plays out in what we do together in the liturgy every week. But it especially does so during these 40 days of Lent. So think back to a few minutes ago and the procession in, and we process in by reciting the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, God's moral law. And when we do that, two things are really happening there. The first thing is that we're acknowledging that God's law is holy and just and good. And we're saying that it's something that we desire to live by. We want our lives to look like that. But second, we're also admitting our own inability to keep that law perfectly. So did you notice that we're only given one answer in response to each of those commandments? Which is, Lord, have mercy upon us. Which is basically the equivalent of throwing our arms up in the air and saying to God, you got me. One after the other, all the way through. You know, there's no multiple choice answer on this quiz. There's no option to say, Lord, um, no, I actually didn't break that commandment this week. No choice. Because when we look at our lives in relationship to God's law, we find that we fall short of the mark on every single point. But the purpose of this exercise isn't to start some giant pity party where we just kind of get together and beat ourselves up and try to self-atone for our sinfulness. The purpose is to actually disabuse ourselves of the idea that we have the power on our own to keep the law. Because right after we admit to God that we haven't kept the law, we immediately ask for his help to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. We say, Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Lord, incline our hearts to keep this law. We're not just admitting that we can't keep the law. We're asking God to come and to free us and to deliver us from the sin that still lives within us. And this continues with the confession where we kneel down before God and admit what we've just said, that we fall short. But we also again ask God to do what we can't do through our own willpower. We ask God to enable us to live a godly, righteous, and sober life life. Note the emphasis is on God doing that for us. And one final place where we see God meeting us at our point of need is in this week's collect, which begins by acknowledging that God sees that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. So remember when I said at the beginning of the sermon that this passage doesn't just contain a harsh reality check 
but it's also full of good news. Well, this is the good news part. Because our powerlessness in the face of our sin isn't the end of the story. See, Paul doesn't just end this section of his letter to the Romans by crying out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? No, he doesn't stop there. He immediately gives us an answer to this cry of desperation. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul immediately points us to the reality that there is indeed someone who sees that we have no power to help ourselves. Someone who comes to us in our powerlessness so that his power might rest upon us. Someone who ultimately took the sin and death which lives within us upon himself, that we might have his life. It's no coincidence that this introspective season of Lent, where we look specifically at the places in our lives where sin still lives, ends with Good Friday and Easter. That it ends with the mighty work that God has done to deliver us from sin and these bodies of death. So you might remember Jessica Thompson, She was with us a few weeks ago leading a workshop at our disciple conference on raising kids in light of God's grace. And her and her mom, Elise Fitzpatrick, co-wrote an excellent book on the topic called Give Them Grace, which I can't commend to you enough, especially if you have young children. And I was listening to an interview a while back with both of them, and they shared a story that I think perfectly illustrates the message of Romans 7. So Jessica was at home with her two boys, who at the time were five and three. And her boys were off in a different room playing together, which if you've ever had young children or have them know, is a blessed moment of peace and respite when your kids entertain themselves in a room far away from you. You also know, of course, that these moments do not last very long. She very soon heard screams emanating from the room where her two boys were, and like the dutiful mother that she is, she took off down the hallway to see what all the ruckus was about, and she walked into the room to find her older son, Wesley, sitting on top of, nay, straddling his younger brother, Hayden, and absolutely pummeling him, absolutely just letting him have it. She saw that Wesley had a bite mark on him, And it was pretty obvious that his younger brother had bitten him, and he was now exacting his revenge. So Jessica reaches down and grabs Wesley and pulls him off of Hayden and looks him in the eye and says to him, Wesley, you must love your brother. You must love your brother, which is the right thing for him to do, right? It's a good thing. Wesley replied to her, though, and said, I can't. I can't. Now, you think that Jessica, and this is what I probably would have done, would have responded by saying something like, oh, yes, you can, mister, and you will, or else, if you value your life. But because she's a good parent and knows the love of Jesus, that's not what she said. With his angry, upset child in her arms, who knew that he didn't have the power to make himself love his brother in that moment, who had just taken a chunk out of his flesh. Jessica looked him in the eye and said to him, Baby, you're right. Run to the rescuer. Run to the rescuer. The last week in our reading from Romans, we heard that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that because of that, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not our sin, not our stubbornness, not even when we know the right and good thing to do. But our honest answer is, I can't. We all have places in our lives where our answer is, I can't. But when I can't is our answer, when we know what's right and yet still can't do it, we also know that we do indeed have a rescuer who we can run to, a rescuer who sees 
that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, yet who gave his very life that we might be delivered by his power. Amen.